Hello, everybody. <laughs> My name is Paul. I am CEO and one of the founders of Blueprint Lab. Thanks for joining us today for our Reach Bravo and Saab Falcon um, integration webinar. Uh, it's the first time we've run this webinar, so um, I hope it all goes smoothly and you uh, get some value out of it. So my name's James. I'm the technical sales and support lead at uh, Blueprint Lab. Been working at the company for about two years now. Um, which is about the same amount of time that the Reach Bravo has actually been commercially available. So myself and this manipulator have a bit of history. But yeah, we want to sort of cap the webinar at around maybe an hour long. We don't want to go much longer than that. So uh, we'll jump right into it if, uh, if everybody's ready. Awesome. So first thing we're going to run through is just how this webinar is going to be broken down. So like I said, about an hour long. Um, first thing we're going to run through is just a little bit of background on Blueprint Lab as a company, um, you know, what we have done in the past, what we are currently doing and sort of where we're aiming to go in the future. And then I'm going to hand over to Paul to give you a bit of background on the Reach Bravo manipulator. So that's the manipulators that we're running on the front of this Falcon ROV here uh, at the moment. Uh, and he's also going to run through both the mechanical and the electrical integration with uh, the Falcon. Good uh, time for me to mention here, this is not going to be a sort of Falcon training video uh, on how to integrate the Bravo onto the Falcon because we'll be here all day. Um, so more just a sort of highlight of um, the capabilities that you can achieve with the Falcon and the Bravo and um, sort of what we've chosen to, to run here. Uh, and then we'll finish off with uh, a demonstration. We've got both the Reach Bravo 7 and the Bravo 5 on the front of the Falcon currently. And uh, yeah, we'll give you a quick demonstration of them moving around. So jumping straight into it, Blueprint Lab, um, what do we do? So we're a Sydney-based company, uh, about 30 employees strong uh, as of 2021 closing off. And the vision that we've sort of created for the business is to extend human reach into harsh environments. So harsh environments being subsea, um, you know, nuclear applications, uh, and even space. And our undertaking to achieve this vision is to create these tough, durable, advanced manipulation and perception systems. Now that's an important part as well. Like we do develop manipulators here, but we also develop topside control systems, software integration systems. Uh, so we're not just a manipulator company, we're a manipulation and perception systems company. Quick bit of background on Blueprint Lab. If you haven't been to one of these webinars before, we're just gonna breeze through this. Um, so founded five years ago in 2017, when uh, the company actually released the world's smallest underwater grabber. And then this really quickly sort of rolled into the following year, the release of the world's smallest underwater uh, manipulator. So this is our Reach Alpha 5 uh, unit, which is quite a popular unit uh, among customers. Going on a few years, we had the master arm being released in 2019. So that's our topside controller that you use to control both the Alpha series and the Bravo series as we'll see today. Uh, Reach Bravo came out in 2020. Uh, this was a complete redesign from the Reach Alpha. This is not the, uh, you know, the same gearing system or motors. This was a completely new manipulator. Uh, and then 2021 hit the milestone of 500 manipulators shipped, which was great for us. Um, spent a bit of time sort of refining the design of the Bravo. Um, so you'll sort of see the, the nearly finished product here today. Um, and then, yeah, spent a bit of time on perception and autonomous systems uh, like cameras as well. How is Blueprint Lab different from other, you know, manipulator manufacturers? I think there are sort of four points here. And the main one for us is, is robustness, how tough these systems are. You know, whether that's doing testing like impact testing or real world testing, taking the Falcon down to uh, our testing bay uh, and running it through its paces, we wanted these to be as durable as possible. Performance, we didn't want to sort of go in either class, we wanted to make them the perfect combination of size and strong. Effectiveness, just how easy they are to use uh, for customers. And I think you'll see in today's webinar, they are quite intuitive both to use and to integrate and uh, advance to stay up with the ever-changing world of robotics. Those were our sort of four main points. Just to finish off the summary of Blueprint Lab, a couple of sort of main areas that we're involved in, some industries. Probably the key one for today's webinar would be NDT inspection. Um, so this is big in sort of the oil and gas industry where there's hundreds of miles of piping to be inspected. 
Uh, we've had examples of both UT probing um, and ACFM scanning of subsea pipes um, using our manipulators. So that's quite a big one. Uh, off the back of that, deployment and recovery. You can see in that photo in the top right there, that's a Reach Bravo um, actuating a shackle uh, in order to hook onto uh, what looks like a rope. So that can then be sort of hoisted back to the surface. So yeah, we've got a, a lot of different industries that these manipulators are operating in. I'm gonna pass over to Paul and we'll run through some technicals of the Reach Bravo. Thanks, James. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna start with just a bit of an overview of the manipulator itself. I'm not gonna go into too much detail because um, we wanna talk more about the complete system, but the Bravo is a manipulator, but it's also a system. So you can see on the front here, we have a five function on the left and a seven function on the right. Um, we go all the way up from a single function rotator or a single function grabber all the way up to seven functions. It is even feasible that we go beyond that, but at the moment, um, that's sort of our offering. And what allows us to do that is that the Bravo is made up of modules. So it's a completely modular system. All the actuators are independently controlled, um, have their own internal electronics, controllers, encoders, motors, gearboxes, and you can kind of string those together in different combinations. We offer a sort of standard set of combinations, but um, if you have a very specific requirement, you can reach out to us and we can usually come up with a, a sort of customized solution. What's also different if you're coming from a, a background in hydraulic manipulators is that the Bravo is a fully integrated system. So it's got all its processing on board. It's got all its power management on board. You essentially plug in a power connector and a comms connector um, and you plug that into the vehicle and that's it. There's no bottle, there's no hydraulic pumps. Um, what you see on the front there in the manipulator is the complete package. There's no external leads apart from the, the cables that connect to it at the base. At the end, it's got, um, I think on this one, we've got a sort of quad overlapping jaw set. And then on the seven function, there's a parallel jaw set. Um, we make a, a, a large array of different jaw sets and um, that's sort of continually expanding depending on customer requirements. So. Some specifications of the Bravo, it weighs roughly 10 kilograms in air, five kilos in water. Um, this is the, the Bravo 7, that is. Obviously it gets lighter the, the lesser degrees of freedom you have. Um, it will lift 10 kilograms at full reach, full reach being around 800 millimeters long. Um, so it's fairly high torque. It's got uh, various communication options. So you can talk to it via ethernet, 485 or 232. Um, so three different communication op options. It takes anything from 24 volts up to 48 volts, making it fairly adaptable from a power management um, standpoint. It's also got uh, other accessories. So you can plug in an IP camera that we provide um, at the end effector for getting a live uh, video stream. We also provide an accessory port that allows you to plug in third party um, probes or cameras uh, that can be accessed um, through the sort of same, same connection that you use to control uh, the Bravo. So that's the, a, a very brief overview of the Bravo. If you want more information, I encourage you to have a look at our Bravo webinar, which is online, um, and that's got, uh, has more detail. I'm gonna talk a bit now about this specific solution. I think the, the main thing to note is that it is a skid-based solution. So you can see here, we have the standard Falcon ROV, and then similar to a hydroelectric manipulator skid, um, we have a skid uh, mounted on the bottom. It's held on by a couple of aluminum brackets, and um, it is fully removable by undoing those brackets. So it's an independent skid. The skid hosts one or two manipulators on the front, it's got buoyancy foam, uh, which is also in, uh, dependent on each manipulator. So if you wanna add a second manipulator, there's a second block um, of foam that mounts on there. Um, and it's also got adjustable weights at the rear for, for balance. You trim it to whatever you uh, set up you want, but I'll talk more about that in a second. Um, so if we look at the, the key components, we've got the skid, we've got the Bravos, 
We've got a cable, which is our power and communications cable that runs from the manipulators into the vehicle. We have the Falcon ROV itself. We have the surface control unit, which we don't have in the screen at the moment, um, but you'd be familiar with that. And then addition to that, you will also need another computer or a laptop, um, and you'll also need a way of controlling the arm. So you can control them directly on screen, or you can use a master arm uh, controller, which I will show you in a sec. So I spoke a bit about um, the skid itself. It uh, weighs about 12 kilograms, um, including the foam, aluminum brackets, polypropylene, so it's neutrally buoyant. It's also independently balanced from the vehicle. So when you, when you remove the skid, the vehicle remains balanced and you attach the skid um, and it should all uh, stay um, balanced. Um, and it hosts up to two manipulators in its, in its current form. I'll just jump in there. So we've got a question from Matthias. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. It says, good morning. Is the robot pressurized internally for deep sea usage or can it withstand the pressure difference? Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, so the, um, these manipulators are one atmosphere or actually less than one atmosphere internal. So we pull a vacuum inside that allows us to monitor for leaks. So they are not internally compensated. There are no oil in these manipulators. There is work being done at the moment to develop a compensated version of these. So uh, currently these, these ones on this vehicle are rated to 300 meters. We have a new um, version 10 coming out soon, which will be 450 meters. And then we hope to do a, a far deeper version in the next 12 months, which will have oil compensation and will allow you to reach a greater depth. Yeah, great question, Matthias. That's a, a recent ad for us, so it's a good one. All right, I'll talk quickly now about the electrical integration, which is often the more complex part of these setups. Um, as you all know, if you're familiar with uh, Saab Falcons, there are lots of different ways you can set up this vehicle. And there's also lots of different combinations available. So on our specific setup, uh, this is a fiber um, vehicle. So we have an ethernet connection. So we can essentially plug the Bravo straight into the junction box in the vehicle through a penetrator and a cable that we supply into the 48 volts of the main supply and then into the ethernet channel. That's one option. If your ethernet port is already taken up by a sonar or something else, then there's a few other options. One is to um, put in a switch, so either internally in the junction box to provide more ethernet ports, or an external switch to break out um, an ethernet port for the Bravo. Another option is not to use ethernet at all and you use either the 485 or the 232 link. So you could, using the same cable that we provide, instead of hook up the ethernet inside um, the Falcon, you hook up the 485 into one of the spare ports and then um, talk to the manipulator that way. One disadvantage of that setup is that the camera feed isn't able to go um, over 485 due to the bandwidth limitations and therefore you won't be able to run the, um, the wrist camera of the Bravo using a 485 connection. But apart from that, it's a very uh, feasible way of doing integration and is far simpler and more affordable if you don't have a fiber version of, of the Falcon and therefore do not have um, Ethernet ports available. In terms of power, we can go directly on the 48 volt bus. As I mentioned, that provides up to, I think, 380 watts, which is more than enough for um, a, a Bravo 7 with uh, full load capacity. If you are using an AUX pod for whatever reason, I think those are limited to around 150 watts. So um, it's pretty good for 95% of the time, but if trying to move 10 kilograms at, around at full speed, you may sometimes uh, clip that 150 watts, which is not a big problem, but it does just sort of pause and then restart. So we have ran both combinations. This is currently our Falcon, um, but when we first started doing integration on a loan unit, um, yeah, we, we did it through an AUX pod and, and it works pretty effectively too. And the good thing about that as well, the, the Bravo is a pretty customizable manipulator. So 
if you are worried about clipping that wattage limit, it's quite easy to just lower the torque or lower the maximum velocity that each joint can, can do. And yeah, it's quite easy to end up under that, that 150 watt limit. Yep. Um, yeah, for sure. You, you can limit the, the torque on there and um, uh, amongst a bunch of other things too. Um, there is another option, which is actually the way we have this set up at the moment, is using Bravo Hub, which is a, another piece of hardware, which is essentially an Ethernet switch, but it allows us to plug uh, two arms into a single Ethernet channel and um, it, it splits the power and the communication and in the future it will also allow us to do more smart things such as uh, using dual manipulators at the same time to do to both avoid each other and do more collaborative work such as like lifting heavier objects simultaneously so it's a it's an extra piece of hardware but in some instances it can make integration uh, far simpler um, on the top side setup depending on how you've wired in your Bravo. If it's an Ethernet um, installation, then uh, on the top side surface control unit, you essentially hook your laptop up to the Ethernet port and that, that will allow you to connect to the Bravo via its unique IP address. If you have a 485 or 232 connection, then you would need the appropriate adapter to your computer on the top side, whether it be USB or something similar to that. So all of that we can provide, it's fairly straightforward. Um, and we're kind of trying to do a one size fits all with the solution. But um, as I said, this vehicle does come in many different combinations. So uh, please speak to us if you have a sort of unique requirement uh, for your specific installation. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit now about the other two top side components that are required. The first one is reach control, which is our uh, top side software. And the next one is the master arm. I hand it over to James to give you a very brief overview of reach control. Um, it's not actually the reach control that's running these manipulators now, just due to not wanting to mess around with the network settings too much, um, but uh, it should give you a, a bit of an idea of it, what it's capable of. For sure. Just before we jump in, guys, got a question from Sajad. Thanks, Sajad. He said, hi, guys. Is there a sample mounting bracket you can show for the Bravo 7? I may need to um, clarify that uh, question a little bit more. So a mounting bracket. So the Bravo actually mounts directly into the base here. It's got four M8 bolts that are holding it Currently from, from a side mount, it also has a very similar hole pattern on the base. So you have two options there. We also do ship it with a sort of aluminum mounting bracket that just makes it easier to clamp to a table. Um, if that's what you mean, I hope that answers your question. If not, please, please clarify and I'll, I'll try and do a better explanation. Yeah, for sure. And straight out of the box there, so Jad, like Paul said, you'll have that aluminium plate. So that's got all the holes to mount to either the side or the base of the Bravo. So you should be at least be able to, you know, go straight away into a bench test and get it up and running. And yeah, like we said, this skid is all machined to match both those, those holes. So yeah, you should be able to mount straight onto this skid if, uh, if you're using this. All right, I'll just jump into reach control. So before I share my screen. Reach Control is the software that we produce in-house. It's sort of our way of integrating master controllers with slave manipulators. Um, we try to make it as universal as possible um, to sort of account for all the different ROVs and all the different setups uh, out there. So yeah, let's jump into it and have a quick look. Um, so this is Reach Control. So what you can see first of all is uh, we have a 3D sort of environment in the background here. And when your manipulator is plugged in and communicating, this 3D model in the background will actually uh, jump to the exact position that the arm is in. So you should be able to look at the software and at all times be able to see exactly where the arm is, exactly how the arm is moving when you're controlling it. Um, and yeah, so just to highlight some sort of strong points from reach control here, when I say we're trying to make it as universal as possible, what I mean is we have a, a method of connecting ports, so you can either connect via serial or via UDP here. And then we link each of those ports to a sort of a device, either that being a, you know, a 3D model Bravo device or a control system like a master arm. And then this allows you to do some quite powerful things. So you could have sort of uh, maybe two manipulators running on the same 485 line. Um, you could have one 
slave, uh, sorry, you could have one master controller controlling two slave arms and have them doing exactly the same. So we really wanted to make this as, as sort of versatile as possible without overcomplicating everything for the user. Um, down the bottom, just a couple of uh, graphical panels, which are obviously showing nothing at the moment. Um, but yeah, you'll have position readings, velocity readings, current and torque. And then over on the bottom right here, we've got a, a sort of on-screen control panel. So position presets is pretty much just a stow, a deploy, um, and then two other positions that you like to regularly sort of travel to. Um, so pressing and holding one of these will transport the arm to a position. Um, and then say you've deployed, you can perform your exercise and then you know, press and hold the stow button and it'll return back to the vehicle. Um, a couple of control methods as well. So right now I've got velocity selected here, which is why I'm getting these arrows popping around. Uh, so if the arm was on and connected, I could just press and hold these and we could uh, sort of control joint by joint. Uh, you also have the option of doing jog, which is, which is position mode, so sort of moving five degrees at a time. And then global, which is kinematic mode. So with reference to the XYZ in the base, you can sort of move the end effector in those Cartesian movements there. Uh, so I think that's a pretty good summary of reach control. Anything you want to add to that at all, Paul? Yeah, I think that's a fairly good um, summary. It's a it's an ever-expanding program. Um, it also allows you to view the IP feed from the wrist camera if you have one plugged in, um, and also a whole bunch of other tools that we developed specifically for customers, such as measurement tools. So say you wanted to move along a surface, um, take a measurement at a point, and then move to another point and take another measurement. It allow, allows you to do that sort of um, thing. And it's a you know, kind of um, an ever evolving thing. I think another thing that's worth mentioning is that you don't have to use reach control. Yeah. Uh, the setup that we're proposing here is that you do use reach control, but as a sort of more generic uh, Blueprint Lab manipulator integration setup, one can, uh, we do provide our comms protocol to customers so they can do a direct integrate integration. And you can also plug a master arm uh, via 485 directly into a manipulator to, to control it. So reach control is not essential, but uh, it's certainly a powerful tool, not only for controlling the manipulators, but also for, for setup. So uh, some of the setup stuff, you can set up workspace restrictions, uh, you can set up stow and deploy positions that it'll move to at a touch of a button, uh, that sort of thing. So it's a fairly powerful tool and kind of um, breaks out all the features of our products, but it's not not required. And I'll talk about that maybe a little bit more in, in, in future developments. For sure. So we've just got a couple more in the chat here. So Mateus has said, can you do Cartesian on the gripper? So yeah, good question. Um, so we have two methods of Cartesian movement. The first was from the base. So that's the XYZ relative to the base of the Bravo manipulator. And then we also have an end effector XYZ. So as this manipulator is pointing down like this, the Cartesian would sort of be in this frame here. And that allows you to sort of move directly along the path the manipulator is, that, sorry, that the end effector is facing. And then also we have roll pitch and yaw in all of these as well. So really useful for things like doing pipe scans. You can sort of wiggle the manipulator around till it's facing the pipe and then you can travel along that X axis. And then as you're going around the pipe, you can slowly yaw yourself around to sort of match that radius of the pipe. Um, really good question and, and something that we've been investigating sort of autonomously as well. Yeah, um, that's, those two are certainly, certainly the case. Um, there's also, uh, some more developments which should be released, I think, in the, in the, uh, very soon in the, in the coming weeks, which is you can actually set the, um, your frame of reference. So James mentioned global frame of reference, which is like with respect to your base or with respect to the vehicle. Um, there's end effector frame of reference, which is set as the center of the jaws, but you can also set a frame of reference either visually on reach control by dragging around a triad or by inputting dimensions. And where this is really useful is you may have seen in the video at startup where we grab a CP probe, for example, we actually set the uh, frame of reference to the end of the probe, which means when you're looking through a camera and you want the probe to go in, out, left, right, roll pitch your, um, you can press those buttons either through reach control or a PlayStation controller and it will move 
with respect to that endpoint. So pretty powerful. Another thing we've been using it for is to rotate uh, a valve, for example. So you can go touch the center of the valve with the manipulator, move a set distance, grab the valve, and then rotate around that point. And um, it will sort of do a really clean arc around the center of the valve. So those are some of the things we're still kind of working on and just um, ironing out all the niggles, but I'm definitely going to, um, they have some very uh, good use case examples, especially when trying to do inspection. Definitely. Yeah, there's a great video on our, our YouTube, Matthias. If you want to go and see that valve turning, you'll see the, uh, the custom, custom uh, triad there. Yep. Cool. So I think the next thing I'll talk about quickly before I jump into moving these things around is um, the, the master arms. So there's a couple of different control methods for controlling the manipulators. You can use a PlayStation controller. You can use a 3D mouse, an Xbox. Um, with those things, you can map them any which way you, you, you feel. Uh, so you can make any button or any joystick control any joint. You can also have them not control single joints, but control uh, end effect uh, um, XYZ movement, um, as we just spoke about. But I think far and away, the most popular way of controlling these manipulators is using the master arm, master slave uh, technique. It's fairly standard in working class manipulators. And I think, at least from my experience, um, it's definitely got the, the quickest sort of um, ramp up in terms of learning to use these things effectively. Uh, there's definitely still a bit of training involved and the more you do it, the better you get at it. But it's, it is uh, fairly intuitive once you get the hang of it. Um, and it also provides you with like inherent feedback of where your manipulator is. So uh, with a seven function manipulator, you can uh, move it around in all these directions, but at some point you get to the end of your workspace and you're unable to um, either reach further in a certain direction or get into a certain orientation. And you kind of lose track of what that is when you're using a gamepad, whereas with the master arm, you, you sort of always know what movement you're limited to. And this is especially true in a five-function configuration where your movement is very limited and um, without a sort of master manipulator matching that configuration, it's pretty hard to, to keep track of where your limits are. Um, our master arms have uh, the same number of joints as the manipulator. They've got a joystick on the end, which allows you to open and close the jaws, but also to rotate the end effector if that's how you want it set up. They've got a pause and a play button um, at the end, which is the same button, but it allows you when it's held in to be paused. And what this means is that it's a relative controller. So anywhere you start the master arm from, um, the slave will start to follow it. And obviously if the two are not matched in position, um, this becomes pretty unintuitive. But if they are matched, it's very intuitive. What it does also allow you to do, though, is get in a more ergonomic sort of position when controlling the arm, as opposed to having them exactly matched, um, where you may be working all the way down here if you're trying to work underneath the ROV, where um, in reality it's far more comfortable to be um, up, up at this sort of height. Um, and just to reflect something Paul's just mentioned as well there, so you might have heard him just say that the joystick left and right can be mapped to the wrist rotate. And some of you might be thinking, well, what's the point of that if I'm going to be sort of controlling my arm like this? We can map, map it to the rotate joint in the actual arm as well as the joystick left and right. And the difference that we found users say is when you're trying to grab onto something and say, you know, rotate a valve to you know, actuate something sub C, you don't want to be holding the master controller and rotating that joint by hand, it's very sort of clumsy and clunky to be trying to hold every other joint still. So that's where the joystick comes in the left and right. You can move in, you can grab the valve you want to do, and then just hold that joystick to the left and you'll actuate that rotate round. The other side of that is like those fine movements where you're trying to get in there and, and grab something. It can be a little tricky to sort of get your, like, like Paul's saying, you know, be intuitive about uh, controlling the wrist if you're doing it with the joystick. So mapping it back to that rotate joint just makes it really easy for you to control. Yeah, thanks, James. Um, I'm just going to quickly do a um, 
uh, a bit of a demo of this. So we've got a five function here, uh, which I can move around with this one. We should have a seven function here. So you can see by uh, holding in my, I've got a stow and deploy button here, which goes to a preset position. This, this position can be anything at the moment. I've, I've sort of set it to a position which uh, feels intuitive for me. And then from there, I can start to operate. So it matches me uh, fairly precisely. Um, I can go down, hopefully, and grab this pair of pliers. Um, obviously, you know, underwater looking through a camera, that's going to be a bit of a harder thing to do. But it's fairly um, of an intuitive system. Um, uh, on the Falcon, like, obviously, I, a question we get a lot is there's no uh, pitch control on the Falcon. The manipulator does have an in-water weight of around four and a half kilos. So when you're moving around like this, there is a bit of shift in pitch and also in roll as we only have a single function, uh, sorry, a single thruster. Um, we get around five to 10 degrees in, in sort of moving in, in what I just showed you there, but it still seems to be a very controllable solution. Um, it's no different to a hydraulic setup, which also has an in-water weight, except you have far more degrees of freedom and far more dexterity. Um, we've also got uh, workspace restrictions set up for the Falcon so that we uh, can't crash into the vehicle, we can't damage the camera um, when, when moving around. We've found that with the arms mounted where they are, um, we get a fairly good field of view from the standard camera on the Falcon. Obviously, if you have a wrist camera or you have additional cameras on the vehicle, you'll get a slightly better um, uh, view or a bit better depth perception. You can also have two, cam two wrist cameras if you have two manipulators and then kind of use one as a visual guide for the other one, sort of similar to, to how you would um, perhaps do it on a, on a larger vehicle setup. So we kind of see this as pretty big game changer for this size vehicle compared to what's previously been available. Um, we're still sort of in the infancy of testing this setup and, and pushing the boundaries of what's possible. We really have a strong focus on at the moment on the NDT market and hope to develop a lot of tools uh, to help um, push that forward. Some of the stuff is pretty advanced, but in the short term, looking at sort of tool trays for deploying CP probes with the arm, so you could set uh, preset positions where the arm is um, able to go sort of grab a, uh, a probe out of, the, um, out of a tray or, or um, um, like put it back and change it for another one. Um, and also um, some like end effectors to help accommodate that, um, that, that set up. So I think uh, we've still got a bit to go. I'm sure we're going to learn a lot as we ship more of these systems to Falcon operators around the world, um, get feedback on how usable the system is uh, and how, kind of guide us in where best to develop new tools, uh, new features for, for making this more effective. But uh, so far the feedback's been really good. Um, we're lucky enough to have a vehicle in-house now, which has really allowed us to, to do a pretty um, streamlined integration of the system, as well as provide pretty good uh, technical support for Falcon owners. So um, Saab is obviously um, pretty good on that front, but we uh, can work with them in, in sort of uh, yeah, giving a full, full integration picture. For sure. All right, I think we're pretty close to wrapping up, guys. So any final questions, get them in. Um, we did have one before, not in the chat, just from a third party, actually. The question was, um, did we have a lot of help from Saab when designing this sort of integration kit, or was it, was it a, a joint project, or was it purely Blueprint Lab? Yeah, I mean, we, we've been working with Saab for, for some time. Um, we, we're fairly good, good friends with, with the team over there. And yeah, we certainly got a, lo a lot of feedback from them. So I wouldn't say we got uh, sort of direct help, but we got a lot of feedback 
as to what they felt their customers would be uh, most happy with. Recently at Ocean Business, we had uh, one of our manipulators on a Falcon, on, on the skid that we designed. So we're certainly partners in this together. Um, and you know, for some of our customers, we've prov been providing joint support. So we're, we're definitely not rivals in this space. And um, I think having them on board with it is, has been really helpful. Definitely, yeah, really good. So we had one from Sven, thanks Sven. Uh, he said, are you working on integrations with other vehicles? Uh, yeah, we certainly are. So uh, Citronics Valor is, an, is another um, great vehicle that we've been uh, collaborating with very closely. They've, they've integrated um, our uh, Bravo system, Seymour Marine, uh, have also integrated our system. Okay. Um, this is a fairly fairly new product um, uh, compared to some of our uh, other ones such as Alpha. So we're still kind of uh, building that uh, OEM or ROV database. But um, yeah, there's been a lot of interest. I think for this size vehicle, this is still a pretty unique value proposition to have a fully electric uh, manipulator on a vehicle this size just makes a lot of sense. So. Um, we're seeing pretty widespread adoption and we, uh, we expect to see even more as we kind of build up the features and, uh, and a stronger customer base. Definitely. Yeah, if you were at Ocean Business last month, you would have seen the Mako from, uh, from Simon and his group with the Bravo on the front there. Um, that, was, that was great to see that integrated. I think that was the first one from them with our, our Bravo arm, so that was really good. And yeah, like Paul said, Citronics Valor is one that we we'll hopefully be doing a webinar for in the future if we do get a vehicle in-house. Um, yeah, we're very interested to, to try out some other vehicles like that. Cool, we've got one more question here from Matthias again. Our customer was wondering how much spare cable is running through the arm for tools. I guess there are no power cables available, but would there be data cables accessible for the gripper so we can add a tool with integrated sensors? Yeah, definitely. So like, like I said, um, there's a camera currently on the end of this one, but we offer an accessory port. I don't have one with me right now, but it's got a power output up to three amps, I believe, and completely variable between 12 and whatever the bus voltage is. So you can set through reach control whatever you want that voltage to be. So if your probe takes 12 volts, for example, you can set it to 12 volts. It also has ethernet, coming out of there. So if you plug some, some uh, ethernet device in there, such as say a sonar, um, it will appear on your network through an integrated switch in the base of the arm. And it's also got 485. The 485 port there is not directly connected. It's multiplexed through the, the CAN bus within the arm. So there's, there's certainly power and there is um, you know, a pretty adaptable power solution plus uh, a few different communication options. So we've tried to make that as kind of generic as we possibly can uh, for third party components to be mounted to the end. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, if you're going to be mounting something like a probe, then yeah, you'll be using that accessory port to provide comms and power to that unit. Um, a great follow up question as well. Is this available when the camera is installed? Unfortunately, no, it's, it uses the exact same port. So you literally just unscrew the cap there and you have access to that, uh, that port that runs internal to the arm. So that provides ethernet to the camera when it's integrated and the accessory port when it's integrated. So you can't have them running at exactly the same time. You have to bring it back up and swap them out. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a, gonna be a change in the future. Yeah, I, th I think um, we've had this question a couple of times and I, I think the plan is, um, and you know, we, we obviously welcome feedback on this is to have uh, that port have the camera just as standard because like why wouldn't you have a camera to have lights which it doesn't currently have and then again and then another switch to break out yet another ethernet and 485 and the power so um, we hope to kind of have a one size fits all accessory port there uh, so you don't have to make a choice between a camera or an aux pod but we, th we thought it was safer just to do one at a time and make sure they both work before trying to uh, overcomplicate the system. Definitely. No worries. Okay, guys, I think we will wrap it up there. Thank you all very much for joining. Um, if you do have further questions, um, do head to our website. We've got contacts on there. So sales at blueprintlab.com. Feel free to shoot us an email with anything like that. 
um, yeah, we're really happy to see what, or happy to hear what you guys are working on, rather. And yeah, if you do have questions around the system, we're we're more than happy to get into a discussion about it. So do feel free to reach out, and um, yeah, we look forward to what you guys can do in the future. Yeah, thank you very much. Take care.